Dykewell. And I've known Ken for 30 years? Anyway. And I met him at a conference, heard him speak, and he was phenomenal. He's uh, made such an impact on aging, it's kind of hard to describe. He's the person who coined the term uh, healthy aging. And um, as I remember, his wife uh, works with him, also does some very cool stuff, Maddie. And they got involved with this guy named Arnold Schwarzenegger to see how the body ages some years ago when he was still buffer. And um, I tried to integrate that stuff together. Ken's insights have really been amazing. He's the first person to identify the fact that uh, 80% of the holdings in U.S. banks were held by people over age 50. That got the manufacturing community, commercial community, industry involved with older people. So his impact has been absolutely enormous. Um, he's got some kind of a PhD in psychology or something, and he has written, I guess, uh, let's see, one, 16 books, if I remember, um, which is also a lot of work. One of them, Age Wave, has had a profound impact internationally, uh, off the charts, uh, in terms of really, really making a difference. Comes from a very talented family, uh, son doing some stellar work. And this is a guy who not only gets it, but has really shaped the way people look at older persons and old persons and uh, aging persons. And Ken, I welcome you. So, let me ask you guys a question before I roll into my uh, presentation. How many of you would like to live to a hundred? No matter what? Yeah, it all depends. So, before we get started, turn to whoever's sitting next to you and give them your logical explanation for why more than half of the hands came down. So, like to live to a hundred? Yeah. No matter what, or it all depends, hands down. So what's in that delta? Try, let's see if we can get clear on what's in that delta. What would, what would make it okay to live to 100 and not okay? So I would talk to a lot of you my husband All right. If I might get your attention, please. So, uh, we're going to drill around in that territory in a little bit, but um, thank you, Dennis, for inviting me. Dennis invited me, uh, and I said yes immediately. Um, I think at this convergence of health technology, there are wonders about to happen. And I think they're limited largely, not by capital, but by ideas and imagination. And I also, because I have been fascinated with this aging subject, this is going to sound bizarre, but I got interested in this field in 1973. How many of you were not yet born when I was working in the aging field? Okay, some of you. Um, and I spent 45 years in this subject, and one of the most bizarre things that you could possibly imagine that happened along the way was that I got old myself which I actually didn't really anticipate. I somehow thought I was exempt, uh, but uh, when I turned 65 and could simply not figure out the Medicare explanations, um, I thought, wow, this is really interesting, actually becoming one of these people and trying to make sense of it from this position. So what I'm going to try to do is I, I've gone through many of your bios, and I know you're a really smart bunch, 
And what I'm going to try to do is to throw some things your way that may be alongside or even different than what you currently think, or maybe additive to what you currently think and know. So in order for me to be able to do that, the, the, the kind of the dance I'd like to invite is I'm going to ask you to take all the things you currently think about aging and longevity and health and park them for an hour. That's not going to be easy. But if you can just park them for an hour and allow me to tell you the story as it looks to me, and I'm not going to cover everything, but I'm going to cover a number of things, and then you can bring back in your own points of view and discard whatever you wish of what I've covered. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, great. Uh, first, you probably noticed, but there's a lot of interest in longevity these days. I would tell you, by the way, primarily by men. <laughs> If you think of all the pioneers, you know, Peter Thiel getting blood transfusions, Peter Diamandis and Craig Venter, and yeah, there's a few researchers out there that are women, but there's a lot of magazine covers, and they're even starting to show up in male, female, young, old, and what's going on is that there's this sort of captivation with longevity. And I would tell you that many, 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 many decades ago, I was a regular on a television show called The Merv Griffin Show. How many of you even know what I'm talking about? All right, that's, there we go. That's, a, that's an age question right there. And um, so Merv used to have regulars on his show. You know, it'd be on maybe once a month. And he says, I was a young guy, excuse me, I was maybe 30. Talk about it. I says, well, I'll be your expert on aging. Oh, they all said, bad subject. I said, well, let's call it longevity. Great subject. <laughs> uh, same subject. Different name. Um, this interest in longevity has not begun uh, in the last few decades. Uh, you know, Ponce de Leon was looking for fountains of youth. And by the way, you can get really crazy if you want and look at all the early explorers. We somehow have rewritten the history that they were looking for real estate and gold and ores. They were looking for magical waters and fountains of youth, many of them, because the queens and kings of the day realized that all the wealth in the world, if you're starting to grow sick or old, not worth anything. So the pursuit of the world has partially been influenced by this how do we not get old? How do we not get sick? Um, if you go back even thousands more years than that, the early Confucian notion was that there was an immortality pill. That if you achieved a certain level of consciousness and practice, you would be given this pill. And I also want to point out that the alchemists who gave birth to the chemists, who gave birth to, to the uh, to medicine, who gave birth, what gave birth to this conference, they were attempting to rid the body of its impurities. The alchemists believed it wasn't about turning straw into gold. The alchemists believed that somehow the body had some impurities that proliferated. How do we clear them so that humans could be immortal? None of these things really worked. Uh, there was no effect whatsoever on longevity during century after century after century. What changed it all was public health departments. In the beginning of the 20th century around the world, let's talk about the United States uh, for a little bit anyhow, uh, we began to wash our hands. We began to think about uh, filth. And all of a sudden, some diseases uh, started being tapered down a bit, which then caused more people to be living longer. Uh, the incredible breakthroughs that led to antibiotics, all of a sudden you could get an injection for a disease that would have killed your parents or grandparents. Many people don't think that if you could wipe out a, an illness in a 20-year-old that you're raising longevity for the masses, but you are. Every medical breakthrough alters the longevity curve. How many of you, the other age test, are not quite sure what this is a picture of? Not quite sure. It's okay if you're not. How many of you are totally sure what it's a picture of? Exactly. These are iron lungs for people under 40 in the room. And in those iron lungs are people. And they spent their entire life in that tube, which breathed for them. And they related to the world through a mirror. See these heads? People. Um, I was lucky when I was 30, and again, I'm 68 now, I collaborated on a book with Jonas Salk. And of course, I was being born in 1950, we all were beneficiaries of that Salk vaccine. So one night at dinner, I was asking Dr. Salk about this, and he told me that in the 1940s, 
When poliomyelitis was rampant, people thought we're just going to need more and more iron lungs, better iron lungs, lighter iron lungs, more mobile iron lungs, iron lungs in every community. And Salk had an utterly different point of view, and that was we have to wipe the disease out. I would tell you that our current medical system is an iron lung system, largely. How do we create more friendly, comfortable, lightweight methods to manage people with disease versus saying, why don't we wipe the disease out? <laughs> Dennis is a young boy getting his polio vaccine. Where's Dennis? <laughs> And then, of course, the century of incredible breakthroughs with regard to a, a rich pharmacopoeia, what we learned about health and fitness, lifestyle management, uh, breaking of the DNA code, which we are now beginning to see possibly some extraordinary things, whether it's from CRISPR, whether it's from all sorts of things, stem cell manipulation. What are we going to do with this information, especially as AI gets closer to being able to work it? The effect of it is that over the last 1,000 years, uh, the average life expectation has gone from 25 in the United States to 79, and we're about 30th worldwide with regard to longevity here in the United States, which itself is another interesting dynamic. We spend a lot of money, we make a big fuss about how great it is, yet we don't live very long, so therefore it's not working that well. <laughs> And the point is simple, and that is that throughout all of history, most people didn't age, they died. So back in the 18th century, couples were in saying, gee, honey, you know, what would you like to do after retirement? Because you'd be dead. <laughs> Our medical system really didn't need to be expert at adult onset diabetes or osteoarthritis or hip replacements or uh, cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's, because people generally died young of acute infectious diseases, accidents, trauma, childbirth, before they live long enough to have their bodies wear down. This has never happened before. And you tell me whether that particular curve line is flattening. And that's one of the more amazing things, because as I've dealt with governments around the world, uh, it's always interesting to see their projections. And governments are inclined to make projections about medical breakthroughs that assume pretty well nothing is going to happen. Because then they can rationalize why they're not very well prepared for the pension costs that are coming, but if they really ramped up what they thought the life expectancy was going to be, they'd all be belly up. Let me put this in a grander perspective. This is a chart of the average life expectation over the last 100,000 years. And here the story gets truly uh, interesting. Because medical anthropologists now tell us that throughout 99% of human history, the average life expectancy worldwide was under 18 years at birth. So that doesn't mean that there have not been 40 and 80 year olds. Yes, there have. But not many. Everything about this subject is new. You are going to have ideas during this next hour that no one has ever had before because this has never occurred before in the world. We have not created an auditory system in our public environments designed for the ears of 75 year olds. The chairs you're sitting in were designed for the ergonomic capabilities and back strength of 22 year old men. The lights we use in public environments, these are limited spectrum fluorescent lights. If you look up at them, you might try it, and look down, if you're over the age of 65, you'll see spots for about 45 seconds. If you're younger, you won't see it and they hum, which you probably don't hear because maybe you have perfect hearing. But if you're losing some of your auditory range, public environments weren't designed for you, nor your telephone. We were up in Seattle a few weeks ago. I can't tell you who I was with or what we did or what we talked about, but it was a company in Seattle. And I pointed out to them that you know their interactive devices, I won't tell you the device's name, um, you can't even see the buttons on it. <laughs> have we crafted a world our medical system wasn't designed for older people either in terms of preventing disease or treating them the diseases of aging Medicare was not designed for older people it was designed for doctor reimbursement so you know, I could go on and on and on and on and on buttons you know, if you've got arthritis, trying to work a button is not so easy. If you're a woman and you live alone, how are you going to do the back of your dress? 
So, let's get into Gulliver's world for a moment and have us consider that because we've been a world of the young, uh, we haven't really contemplated the world of the old. I'll just throw in a family issue here for a moment. My son, who just turned 28 a month or so ago, published his first book. It's called Young China. And he's actually in, uh, in Abu Dhabi today giving a speech. And he's been sort of hammering me on the future of China because we think the future of China, the big issues are, let's say, Korea, the Korea, South China Sea, energy, and so on. But if you look at China, their biggest challenge going forward in this century is the aging of the Chinese population because the life expectancy in 1950 in China was 36 years. It is now 75. And with the, with the one-child policy, yes, I know the birth rate in China is 1.6, but with the one-point uh, uh, child policy, you've got a 4 to one demography. You've got all of a sudden, for the first time ever, a relatively small number of young people, more parents, and twice as many grandparents in a country that's got almost no pension infrastructure. So, different than the United States, when they look at something like Alzheimer's, and we think, oh, let's think of a medication that people can take like an AIDS cocktail, you know, HIV cocktail, every day of their life for 30 years, and it might cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, but that's okay. It's not the way China thinks. China's going to think, what are the breakthroughs that will allow us to have healthy older people? Boom. The effect of these changes in life expectation are the two-thirds of all the people who have ever lived past 65 in the entire history of the world are alive today. When do we get old? Well, Bismarck picked 65 in the 1880s when the life expectation was 45 in Europe and the Americas. If we were to use a similar formula, whether it's 20 years older or proportionate, we'd be retiring people today and giving them their old age entitlement starting at about 98. So let's do a survey here. If your job was Bismarck's job from whatever country you, you is your home country, and your job was to create a global age of old, then you could either pick 65, 70, 75, 80, or 85 going forward into this new millennium. How many of you would pick 65? If you raise your hands, one. How many of you would pick uh, 70? How many of you would pick 75? 80? 85? Okay, so the distribution is up somewhere close to 80, where the center would be. And if I were speaking to a group of older people, they would agree, except it would be older. <laughs> so then if I were to say, so I suppose you won't mind not getting your old age entitlement benefits until you're 80 or 85, room would get very quiet. <laughs> so that's a very interesting thing. How many of you are from South Korea here today? South Korea's got the fastest aging population in the world, and their economy is built on youth. So, and their retirement age is somewhere between 55 and 60. How do you have a retirement age that's 55 or 60 or 64 or what the average retirement age is in America when people are now living 20, 25 years after that? Just interesting questions. Uh, I was taken when John Glenn uh, went up, decided to go up to space at 77, and I was asked to do commentary for CNN about this. But I, I knew Glenn. I had testified beside him in Washington. He was a very tough guy. So I watched him in his first interviews, mostly with young reporters. And they were asking questions like, you know, don't you think you're a little old for this? Or what happens if your head blows up? Or what if you have to make, go to the potty? And, um, and, and Glenn turned to them and he said, hey, just because I'll be 77 doesn't mean I still don't have dreams. I will tell you, that really got me thinking. Because I think we think that young people have hopes and dreams, things they want to go after. And that by the time you're 50 or 60, you either did well at those or you didn't, you're done. Move to the sidelines, mellow out. What if one of the biggest changes coming with longevity is that people are going to have new dreams, new hopes? I'd like to learn to play the piano at 55, or maybe I'll start a foundation at 71. Or maybe I'll come back from cancer and run a marathon. Or maybe I'll fall in love at 90. Why does that relate to health? Well, in the old days, most people thought it was just good enough to be alive. 
Now people really want to be healthy because they got something they want to do. They got somewhere they want to be. They got people they want to relate to far more than ever before. average 86 year old is. I know that. Um, I know that. I don't think the average 26 year old could do that. Uh, on the other hand, before Roger Bannister broke the four minute mile, nobody thought humans could run that fast. Now it's pretty standard that people run that fast. Are our older people all vulnerable and frail? You might have seen there was a logo for healthy aging on the opening slide and there's two elderly people with canes moving like this. And it's like that in Great Britain. They have what are called elderly crossings. And the images are of people like that. And that's worth us stopping to think about. A, because it's not correct any longer. And B, because it's not aspirational. You know, what's possible? Do we create a medicine that aims to the low end? Or do we create a medicine or a health system that allows people to be extremely healthy and vital and productive? On top of this longevity phenomenon, uh, by the way, as I turn my head, does this microphone waver a little bit, or are you guys okay? Okay. Uh, we've got another demographic phenomenon, particularly here in the States, but it, there's something like it throughout the world. Um, we had this massive, after the Depression and the war, uh, baby boom, uh, 76 million live births, 10,000 a day in the United States. Uh, but it wasn't just a baby boom, it was a market boom. Because every time the boomers migrated to another stage of life, they exploded market phenomena. So when they became, you know, when they were little toddlers, the baby food industry innovated, baby food in a jar, went off the charts. Um, uh, we were at Johnson Johnson a few months ago, so I'm not saying this out of school, and, and they created a very dangerous precedent because every kid in the history of the world, when their mommy or daddy washed their hair, their eyes would stink because that's what soap does. <laughs> Johnson & Johnson thought these little ones should have no pain. So we had baby shampoo that would have no more tears. Keep that in mind because this is a generation that does not like pain. <laughs> and they're getting old and they're about to have a lot of pain what else real estate markets people said where are these young families going to live they got four kids there's no room in their row houses in San Diego or St. Louis or Newark New Jersey where I grew up and someone said well let's take those farm areas and make new villages let's call them suburbs and people said that's ridiculous whoever would want to live like that. And the property values in those regions grew 500% during that decade. And it wasn't just the homes, it was all the stuff. That the boomers, as they were in their young, the young families, four kids, two parents, all of a sudden it was carpeting, it was refrigerators. By the way, if you think refrigerators is a novel idea, how many of you, I don't know why I'm playing this again today, trivia game, how many of you can remember the Jackie Gleason show, The Honeymooners? Okay, what kind of refrigerator did, did they have in their dining room? Icebox. It was an icebox. That was the 1950s. There were not refrigerators other than in rich people's homes. And how did the ice get in the icebox? The ice man. The ice man delivered it. That was just a little while ago. But now all of a sudden there was stuff and people had it and bought it and the markets were booming on these young families and it just kept going again and again and again. 
I also want to point out that the boomer women, in my view at least, uh, are the most extraordinary dimension of this whole generation worldwide because they were the most highly educated, uh, intelligent, activist generation of women in history. And one of the things they got particularly active about was their bodies. This is the Boston's Women Health Collective, 1968, put out this pamphlet about how women should understand their bodies, which in many ways gave birth to the wellness self-care field. And I want to tell you that these women now are in their 60s and 70s. So how do they want to relate to their bodies and to health? Because it's not the same as the generation of women just in front of them. So this generation, if you look at the United States, and I'll show you the rest of the world in a moment, if you look at the 1950s, many people think, especially really smart, cutting-edge technology people, think that if they can kind of see the flow and the waves of technological change, they can ride them to a better future. I'd like to tell you that you should also track the flow and the change in waves of demography. Because if you can line them both up, this was the 1950s. These are all the age segments in America, which ones grew or shrank relative to themselves. It would have been a great time to be focused on children or young families. 1960s, teenage, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. Tell me if you see a trend forming here. This was the uh, 2000 to 2010. And I'm about to show you the 20 year period in which we're currently engaged. And if you're wondering if I'm a good prognosticator or not, which is clearly an important question you should have, I want to point out that it was me, Ken Dykewell, in the 1980s, I predicted that the first boomers would start turning 65 in 2011. <laughs> and I nailed it to the day. This is the most predictable market force in the history of the world. And yet, almost all of us don't pay attention to it. Because we are youth-obsessed, and we think that technology is the driver. It could be that information, technology, but demography combined is the driver. What I've seen in my decades on this, in this space is that the way most marketers pursue this generation is they wait until it's passed. So when the boomers were young, everything exploded for youth. And now people are still thinking that they ought to track youth for no good reason. But youth, that's where people are forming their brands, which they'll keep for life, they'll have some spending money, but we now know that people don't keep brands for life at all anymore. But we still focus on youth. So the way we see, and when the boomers were 40, all of a sudden became 40 year old thing, we, we just don't seem to be able to anticipate where they're going. And it's like you've got a 76 million pound elephant that's migrating across the lifeline, and every year it gets one year older, but the way most marketers pursue it is they wait for the elephant to pass, and shoot arrows at its butt. <laughs> you want to hit the jackpot, you get out in front and dig a big hole. If you're in the venture business, you're betting on the future, you're in the dig a big hole business, and if you can think about, gee, what are all those 60 year olds going to wear, or need, or eat? What kind of health problems are the 75 year old? That's where the demographic swell is going to be. Uh, people say to me, what about the rest of the world? We've studied most parts of this world. Uh, those countries in the orange, uh, Japan, who's here from Japan? Our friend over there, we've got several folks from Japan. You already know you've got a very low birth rate, a five-year higher life expectancy than ours. It's quite spectacular, but the country is growing older as a result. Uh, Italy, uh, I was at a conference a few months ago where they said, in the next, if things continue, in 150 years, there will only be nine Italians left. <laughs> Japan is depopulating currently. Other parts of the world are depopulating. And we could even argue that it's the shift in demography that gave birth to voting, such as we saw in Brexit and in the last election here, and in all sorts of global power plays. But let me show you the year 2050 and look and see if any other countries become older nations.
So now I want to focus on some of the opportunities. That's okay. Uh, and I'm a little bit of a kind of a mishmash in my own brain because I'm a kind of demographer, I'm trained as a psychotherapist, been working in gerontology, but I've been a business person for the last 30 years. And so I kind of look at things the way I look at them versus not-for-profit academic or venture capital. For me, they got to be seen together. So I'm going to do a little bit of that. I don't mean to impose my way of looking, but it is the way I see things. Um, first, let's just look at who's got money. Young people are really cool and they're really attractive, but they're broke. <laughs> so the fact that everybody wants to target people under 35 is always amazing to me because they have no money. On the other hand, People over 50 control 76% of all the net worth in the Americas. That's interesting. I mean, you may not want to do anything with that, but that's, that's interesting. What else? They have time affluence. It's a very new ingredient in human evolution. The idea that you would have um, 20 years of free time in your adulthood. Well, what do you do with that? By the way, the number one thing that most people want to do with their free time and maturity is to get healthier. What else? The body changes. Not exactly everybody's the same, but the patterns we're all quite expert on, you guys I'm sure are, that as we grow older there's a greater likelihood of circulatory challenges, arthritis of the joints, particularly the uh, ankles and knees, hips, varicosity in the veins, orthopedic impairments, and I could really blow your whole day. <laughs> and on top of that, you've got people wanting to not get old and willing to spend money. I gave a speech a number of years ago for the Fortune 100. It was called the, it's the Business Council. And um, I just threw a kind of an oddball question out. It's 100 people. Uh, mostly men, not all men, but mostly men. My guess is the average net worth was about $100 million. So I said to this room, I said, how many of you, uh, if you woke up and you weren't feeling so good, you looked in the mirror, what was looking back was not what you wanted, and I had some kind of a pill or shot or elixir or thing you could smear on yourself, and it would make you look and feel like you were 35 again. How many would give, I said, 10% of your total net worth for that every year. 20%, 30%, 90% was the response. And at dinner I said, explain that to me. They said, hey, if you're 75 or 80 and you're hurting or you're going blind or you've got cognitive impairment, all the money in the world is not worth it. But if I could feel like I'm young again, with my Rolodex, I could get that money back pretty quick. <laughs> so what will people pay for health? And will it be purchasable on the open market or the black market? Interesting question. People over 50 in the health space, a few stats, and you're probably going to want to take a picture of this one, or Dennis, I can maybe send you this slide. They're responsible for 52% of all personal care products and services. So this is not just, gee, we're going to not, you know, for grandma who's falling down and can't get up. This is beauty creams, hair products, skin. 55% of physical therapy, 57% of health club memberships, 63% of all surgeries done in our country, 63% of all lab tests, 68% of over-the-counter drugs, 70% of vision services, 74% of all vitamin consumption, 77% of prescription drugs, and 82% of home care services. So if you're going to be in the health business, Older adults, mature men and women, they're not going to be at the periphery. And remember, this group is growing worldwide. I want to pull this like taffy just for a second. So when you see that there's problems with hips and knees and ankles, some people might say, okay, so we got to be doing replacement procedures. Other people who might be in the housing industry, and we've worked in all these sectors at Age Wave. Uh, and by the way, let me introduce Robin Reynolds is here. Robin is my sort of partner on all these projects and manages me 
and part of our company. And our age waste president is Elise Pellman. We've been together for 25 years. Can you see you guys over there? Um, so we've worked in all these different industries, and I got a new tell you, the housing people hear about knees and ankles. And they realize, whoa, steps mm -hmm. don't work in an aging population. And then you look at housing stock, and you realize that only 2% of all the housing stock in America is aging friendly. 98% is not because of the changes in the body. And by the way, I could go through every single one of those physical things and show you direct industries and related industries that are impacted. And yes, I know, I do know, and I respect, most people focus on cancer, heart disease. Wonderful. I respect that. We need breakthroughs there. But disequilibria, xerostomia, dryness in the mouth, Hearing loss, pain in, 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 in you know pain from exercising, uh, you know the, the decay of organ systems, vitamin needs, uh, just a whole landscape of possibilities is awaiting intelligence. I'm always amazed. People say to me, "Oh, yeah, we're going to create technologies for the aging population," and I do see a lot of icons like that one. Uh, and then I said, well, what are you thinking about? Oh, everybody's got the same thing. I must get every single day of my life. We've got a brilliant new idea for a business. It's a medical alert system so that if somebody falls down, somebody will be alerted. And I said, you know, there's a great idea, but there's like a billion of those already. Great idea, though. People think of, of sensors, or they think of a grab bar, or they think of an easy open can. These are all really great things. But let's widen our scope a bit, okay? First, there's no question that what we need is for our medical professionals to be able to deal with older people. And I'm not even sure we've named it right. Is, should it be called geriatric? Should it be anti-aging medicine? Should it be longevity medicine? I don't know. I think we're at that turning point. Did you know that we have 55,000 pediatricians in America? Before the baby boom, there were 3,000 pediatricians. The baby boom came along and pediatrics took off. How many geriatricians do we have? <laughs> now, I would tell you, because I'm a bit of an angry guy some of the time, this is scandalous. We have doctors in this country and around the world who are treating older people who might very well be well-intentioned and really good people, but they're not competent. For many years, we created a thing called the Alliance for Healthy Aging, and we were training physicians in medical systems around the country. And the doctors would repeatedly say, kind of late at night after a nice dinner and maybe a couple glasses of wine, hey, half of what we do are do-overs. What do you mean? Well, it's really hard to know what medicines to prescribe for an 84-year-old. It's really hard to know how to bring a person living alone who's older through a procedure. I have an aunt in New Jersey who sort of helped raise me. She's 94. She's got arthritis uh, in her neck and in her hip. So her doctor prescribed Vicodin. So she lives alone. So second night she's on the medication. She got up in one night to go to the bathroom, fell down, broke her neck. So what kind of doctor prescribes Vicodin for a 94 or 4 year old living alone a woman? I mean, it's like, so how do we get our doctors really skilled and capable in a zone where people think geriatrics won't make them very much money? Do we insist on it? You should also know that we've got about 126 medical schools. There's only 13 full departments of geriatrics. 95% of all the docs and nurses who will have graduated last year in the United States will not have taken one elective in geriatric medicine. Not one. And yet we continue to reimburse them, and AARP continues to make their, you know, their margins on their United uh, Healthcare affiliation, and nobody is saying, wait a minute, let's make sure we have the best medicine for an aging population, the best professionals. Not saying people should be geriatricians, but if you're an oncologist or a cardiologist or a diabetologist or a rheumatologist, you probably need to have some special understanding and sensitivity 
And that could be an AI. It maybe it'll just take too long and there's too much resistance. So maybe you know maybe Watson becomes the geriatric intelligence. Next, we need usable information. How many of you can remember, since we have many uh, folks in the room that knew that there was an icebox in uh, Jackie Gleason's living uh, dining room, how many of you can remember when you were growing up, as I can, that the doctors wrote the prescriptions in Latin? <laughs> how many of you, that's the first time you ever heard that? Yeah, that's the way it was done. My doctor, Victor Tepper, my family's doctor, he'd come to the house from time to time. Prescriptions were written in Latin. You weren't supposed to be able to read it. That wasn't your job. The pharmacist could read it and fill the prescription, and your job was to take the medicine. We rebelled against that. I was a part of the rebellion group. When I moved to Berkeley from Big Sur in the early 1970s, I was writing my first book, Body Mind, we thought that the example of the wrongness of the world was not just about authoritarian leadership and colonialization of the world, we thought, how could it be that we can't get a copy of the physician's desk reference? Right. It was a huge movement about getting information accessible to consumers. So we thought that it shouldn't be that doctors knew it all and we didn't know anything. So we created a world that's a junkyard of information. <laughs> Do I think we're better off today? Honest truth? No. Because if I've got a this or if I've got a that, I go on the internet, I can't, I don't know what I'm looking at. There could be 10,000 sites. How do I know which of those are biased or skewed or, it's like, and now you've got ads with some of them, it's like, I, we like the idea of everyone having, you know, I was with Tim Berners-Lee at a dinner in Switzerland when he was just cooking up the future of the World Wide Web. And people asked him, what's the purpose of this? The purpose is so that everyone can, it was sort of subversive, so that we have the freedom of information. Everyone can know everything and share everything. Knowing everything and sharing everything is great, but how do you know what, what's the right information? How do you know what you should do? If you're 81 years old and somebody, your doctor tells you, you've got stage three this, you're going to go look things up. I don't know why we don't have health ways. So that me, Ken Dykewald, I'm 68, I've got this genetic package, I've got this practice of yoga, I've got this diet, and on every day it's changing, so that why aren't I told what I could be best doing each day to get me to the healthiest version of me? Why do I have to piece it together? What else do we need? I'll use nutrition as a territory because I know very few of you have focused on this in your work. But nutrition's a big industry commercially, and it's a big part of the way we go about our lives. And so right now, people are told to eat a healthy diet. And I bet that if we all wrote down on a piece of paper what that is, it wouldn't be for sure. And you know what? What is your name? Yes. Ellen. Should Ellen and I be eating the same diet? Should my kids have the same diet? Duh, we don't know. How can we not know? I mean, we put rockets into space, you know. Elon Musk is attempting to asteroid mine. That's a level of precision far beyond what would be a good thing for me to eat to be healthy. <laughs> I'll give you another example. Vitamin and supplement industry. Organized in the retail setting alphabetically. <laughs> Think about that. Alphabetically. A, B, C, D. What? If I've got mild to moderate arthritis, and I've got hypercholesterolemia, and high blood pressure, and my family's back, what supplement should I be taking? Here's an example. Years ago, it used to be, if you can remember seeing the movie Saturday Night Live, John Travolta worked in a paint store. And the way paint stores used to be is that if you wanted a color green, they would have gallons of every shade of green. So lots and lots of, well, it says 20 to me over there. I'm looking at the clock. Oh, they told me I could go. Okay. Um, 
lots and lots of shades of lots and lots of cans of green, and that required a lot of inventory. And then somebody came up with the idea that we could have this sort of mixing configuration technology where you had a white base and you squirt in a little of that and you could have every color under the rainbow without having to take up inventory. Why do we not have that with our vitamins and mineral supplements? So in Japan actually, there's experimentation with bio labs in home plumbing. So that I can know each morning, based on my own biology that day, what supplements I ought to be putting into my smoothie. <laughs> Why do we not have precision nutrition? Another interesting thing. How many of you have had some rehab in your life? A hip, a knee, a back? Yeah. Um, we got this crazy thing going on, which is that we have a world of increasingly sophisticated technology where we can map the body for movies and digital animations and such. But I had a shoulder replaced about a decade ago, and I went to rehab, and I thought I was in a Neanderthal room. Because we were using stretchy bands and ice cubes. that connects our students with seniors in the USA living in retirement homes. Hello. Hello, hello. Melissa. Hi, Nick. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Is it the first time that I'm talking to someone from another, another country? I'm very excited to be doing this. I look like I'm only 25. <laughs> but I'm eight, I'm eight, eight. <laughs> I live with my old brother. He has 23 years. Do you know, instead of saying he has 23 years, you could say he is 23 years old. I tried to go to Lulapalooza that we have next week, I think, in Brazil, but my mom didn't let me. Ah, uh, you got a good mom. <laughs> good morning, dear Julia. Good morning to you. This is your dad? That's me and my wife when we were young. Oh, you were good looking when you were young. You're still good looking. If you could just dream and have whatever you want, what, would you, what do you think you would like to be doing? I see myself in a big family, though. Know? with a beautiful wife. And I want to thank you for this change of experience, you know. You are incredible. I'm Ricardo. You are my new granddaughter, and I love you. I love you too. And if you were here, I would give you a big hug. Oh yeah, let's hug. Oh. Bye. <laughs> Bye. I'd like to see more social innovation with regard to the use of technology to bring people together. Not just for medical purposes, but for life purposes. What else? We need to make our products, all of them, aging friendly and not disrespectful and not out of tune. I'm going to show you an example that takes a couple of minutes of one such product. Good morning, sir. Ready to get up? Let me get your feet up. How are you doing today? Good morning. <laughs> I remember uh, always looking at my dad's arms like when I was like eight, nine, ten years old. I had arms like Popeye. He was a towboat captain. And I so admired his physique. And now it's, it's a different story, you know? And that's just the way it is. dad had a stroke and now he can't get around he can't walk and he needs me to help him out and my son Luke and I have been doing it and uh, I'd do anything anything for him I can give you a really good mohawk <laughs> there's a definite role reversal that happens I have to wake him up in the morning and uh, take care of him and groom him and shave him and shower him. 
it's, it's actually an honor to do that for your father because he did it for me when I was a kid. My dad's got the greatest face. His squishy face is just amazing. He's sort of thin skinned and I don't want to cut it at all. So I got to be careful with that, with that face. Like he'll just say, do this, do that. You got to make sure that you shave my neck down. You got to do my, my lips up. He you know, was really particular about his sideburns. That's where your sideburns start? Okay. I'm not going to touch your sideburns. Okay, good. Okay? Mm. How am I doing so far, Dad? Okay. You know, it takes me like a half an hour to shave my father, because I have to be so careful. Okay, well, I will, I will, I will. Oh, there we go. Okay, good. I love that face. I'm uh, I'm one of the lucky ones. A lot of my a lot of my my friends my age did not have their dads, and I still have my dad. He always says to me, he he looks up at me after I pour love on him for the whole day, and he says, I don't know what I did to deserve you. And I say, Dad, I got you. I got you, Dad. So I see a lot of tech promotion, and somehow I feel like I'm okay with, you know, singularity and AI and all this and that, but when I see tech without a heart, it's a turn off to me. It's a razor blade. It's got more heart than a lot of the tech products that are being put out there for, to make people's lives better. A couple more points, my last theme. Uh, we also need better science. We need a new era of scientific breakthroughs. And you might say, okay, where should they be focused? And I will tell you, I've only got a couple of minutes to go, and I'm tracking our time, but um, we've asked people in our company, what's the thing you're most scared of? And when people are young, they're scared of all sorts of things, but as people realize they might live a long life, losing their minds, cognitive impairment becomes the biggest fear. And for good reason, that uh, if you're going to live a long life, you're going to have dementia, high unlikelihood. Uh, it is not due to aging, but it correlates with aging. One in three people over the age of 85 have Alzheimer's or related dementias. One in two over the age of 90. One in two. And a lot of people say, oh, you know, uh, oh, there's things you can do. Not really. It's 100% fatal and 100% incurable. And I've been dealing with a lot of kind of the billionaire class who say, oh, I'll be able to buy my way around it. No, you won't. There is no way to buy your way around it currently. I knew President Reagan, I met him. Uh, I did not know Margaret Thatcher. They both had pretty good access to medical care and they both got taken down by Alzheimer's. So, uh, I'm gonna give this as an example. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, five actually, I challenged Peter Diamandis to see if we can create an X Prize to crowdsource solutions to Alzheimer's disease. Because I am quite taken by crowdsourcing as an additional new technology. How does one reach out to the world to try to solve grand challenges or major problems? It's not the way things have been done historically with proprietary patents and companies and universities that have kind of kept their ideas often to themselves. And so our goal was to come up with identifying appropriate bio-targets that could be actionable to uh, crowdsource, whether they be brain hackers, gamers, AI people, biochemists, botanists, healers, doesn't matter. Stop the disease. Match brain span to lifespan. And I'm going to show you my last clip before I tie this up and we have a moment together. Uh, I thought, can we crowdsource support? This is not crowdsourcing solutions. So we had the major competition in the fall where the five major world challenges came together. Uh, healthy water, healthy air, security, uh, democracy, and so on. And we had to compete against them. And we won, I would say. Uh, not that I would say. We took it. Um, but it was partly because a week or two before I wrote notes to people, many I didn't really know, and I said, can you help us by putting your weight in to let people know how important this is. A little bit sort of a different ask. This is what we got. 
Not since the Middle Ages with the bubonic plague have we been afflicted as a society across the world by such an epidemic. As our population ages and people live longer, one of the greatest challenges we face as a nation is putting an end to Alzheimer's disease. More than 4 million people live with dementia in Africa. Now Alzheimer's disease has become a global issue. I personally experienced the devastating impacts of Alzheimer's as it has hit my family home. These were not their YouTube clips. Every one of these was created in a request in response to a request to be part of the team. Alzheimer's. My mother now has Alzheimer's. Memory gone. But now the disease has come from being been diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. For almost 40 years I've been working to find a cure and effective <laughs> treatments for Alzheimer's disease. Lily's been in Alzheimer's disease research now for over 30 years, but we know we cannot do it alone. This disease is a beast. We've got to take a radically different approach to stopping this disease. I don't envision there being something to save my husband or my mother who's too old, or for me, as a matter of fact. One of the things we all know as scientists is that some of the greatest breakthroughs happen at the convergence of different disciplines when different perspectives come together. So crowdsourcing, creating networks, looking for new kinds of solutions that are unique, novel, and fresh, that's the way we will make progress. The time is now, and the XPRIZE can make it happen. I can't think of a more important topic for an XPRIZE. So the time really is now to go ahead and do an XPRIZE for Alzheimer's disease. The technological revolution that is applicable to this space is great. Maybe it'll come from artificial intelligence, perhaps physics. That's the beauty of crowdsourcing a solution to this devastating health problem, and why I'm so excited about XPRIZE Alzheimer's. We need an XPRIZE because I believe that's the only way we're going to solve this disease. I will do all I can to support this very important initiative from the XPRIZE. We're committed to working with the XPRIZE. We love the concept of the XPRIZE. But I think the XPRIZE has tremendous potential. XPRIZE, we've got to do it now, and let's get on with it. Please cast your vote for the Alzheimer's XPRIZE. The world needs it. Please, vote for the Alzheimer's XPRIZE team. A vote for the Alzheimer's XPRIZE team could change the course of millions of lives, including my own. Thank you. that the night of the event raised $25 million on the spot to get the prize funded. So keep an eye on that uh, later this year. My point to all this is that we're in the midst of a historically unique event, a longevity revolution. Uh, at the same time, demographics are pushing more and more people into the second half of life, both as consumers and patients. Uh, and with that comes a the uprising of all the sorts of conditions that travel with maturity for which solutions are desperately needed. And there is a marketplace. And for me, we need to have a medical field that's competent and precise and intelligent. We need to have information consumer facing that's user friendly. We need to have specific and targeted nutrition so people can do the right thing. We need to have a world of fitness and re rehab that's space age level, not Neanderthal. We need to have tech that brings people together doesn't just create a bunch of isolated individuals. We need to have aging-friendly devices, and it's time for serious scientific attention to wipe out some of these diseases in the first place. I have run to the end of my time. I will be here all day and a little bit tomorrow morning, so I'll be here during lunch and during the reception, and I'm, and I'm here in the Bay Area, glad to field any questions and learn what you guys are doing, and look forward to hearing the rest of the presentations. And I very much want to thank Dennis for putting out an invitation for me to be with you here this morning. Hopefully I've given you a thing to think about or two. I'm going to ask you one thing before I step off the podium. I'm right at the end of my time. If I were to ask you to think of one word that this presentation is causing you to think, just one word, Who would like to tell me what that word is for them? Compassion. Compassion. Hope. Hope. Inspiring. Inspiring. Be bold. Boldness. Possibilities. Possibilities. Aging. Aging. Angry. Angry. Awakening. Awakening. 
Thank you guys very much. We're going to have a great day. Thanks for being here.